Hello everyone and uh, we're here in uh, the green corner and with us is uh, Vandana Shiva. Thank you so much for joining us. You're of, you're of course well known to everyone as a great feminist, a great activist from India. We're so honored that you're with us today. Thank you so much for that. And today's International Women's Day, so it's a perfect opportunity to have you here. So uh, let me start with the easy question, uh, Vandana, namely, how do we do it? How do we fight patriarchy? And how do we finally get to a real equality after so many years of struggle? And uh, well, we can maybe say we're not there yet. Well, I think the first thing in fighting patriarchy is to recognize its structures of domination. And that means recognizing that today it's the convergence of patriarchy and capitalism which I call capitalist patriarchy, that has become the source of huge problems for women. But to imagine equality within that structure that is based on exclusion and is based on a patriarchal science assumption uh, that ignores ecology, treats nature as dead raw material, treats women as a second sex, economic assumptions that totally leaves out women's productive capacities and contributions to the economy, which is the foundation of all economy. And women's politics, women's power in a nonviolent politics, that structure by its very design will constantly take power away from women. And I see us like, you know, here's this giant Titanic which is called today's economy and it's sinking. Do we try and jump on it to it and say, give me a little table on this sinking ship? Or we say, no, 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 we've got lots of rowboats, we've got lots of lifeboats. We're going to not just create another path for ourselves, we're going to rescue those who are sinking. Mm -hmm. So and that to me is the eco-feminist project for today. Defending the planet, which is the base of all life and all economy, and, and living women's capacities, which are not intrinsic to women in biological terms or genetic terms, but have been left culturally in them at a time where men were being pulled into violence, into wars, into greed. So at this point where we need more celebration of diversity, where we need more recognition of the invisible, the subjugated, where we need definitely much more commitment to compassion and non-violence, I would say either we'll have a womanly future or we will not have a future as a human species on this planet. So you'd also say those struggles are pretty inter interconnected, for example, environmental uh, rights and uh, women's rights, right? Uh, you know, I think part of the way in which capitalist patriarchy has functioned is through division. It created a whole fake reductionist mechanistic scientific structure based on separating us from nature, as if we were somewhere outside nature, we could own it, conquer it, destroy it, uh, then dividing up nature. Uh, taking away all the relationships and I think the exciting thing about today is that both the ancient wisdoms of cultures like mine as well as the cutting edge sciences of how our gut functions that it's the second brain, the amazing soil web of microorganisms in the soil, all of that is showing that nature is very alive in spaces as well as Gaia as a whole. Similarly, when you really look at what counts, what kind of work counts, the kind of work that counts is where we get food on the table, where we grow healthy, nourishing, organic food, where when a child has cancer, there's someone to take care of them. When a parent is sick, there's someone to take care of them. And that's the economy, because economy is caring for the household, including all members of the household. That's where oikos mm -hmm. is the root of economy. Now, that's the economy women have continued to participate in, even while it was treated as the not, not the economy. What we have to do is put that at the center, mm -hmm. so that when the Titanic sinks, we don't sink. Can you tell us a bit how environmental destruction and also climate change is impacting women in India? I mean, obviously not just there, but there you see it like daily on the ground. Uh, uh, the India, scientifically with all the modeling, is shown as the subcontinent that will suffer the most. First, we've got a very, very large coastline. And we already have severe erosion with the rising sea levels. If you look at Sundarbans at the Bengal side. 
the three extremes that climate change leads to, extreme drought, extreme flooding and rain, and extreme cyclones and hurricanes, we are witnessing all of that. 1999, Orissa had a super cyclone, th three times the velocity of all historic cyclones. Went three kilometers inside, devastated society, 30,000 people died. My region, I come from the Himalaya, in 2013, we had intense rain. In two days, as much rain as we'd get in one month of monsoon. Meantime, the glaciers were melting, a glacial lake burst. And you have the maldevelopment of trying to build 500 dams on the Ganges. All of that added up to a flood we've never seen, and it didn't make it to international news. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people were washed away. But then there's the cli quiet part of climate change, which is not a photo opportunity for TVs. The drought that kills increases women's walk for water. 10 billion human days is what women spend on water. With climate change, that means 20 billion. It means 30 billion. And then it becomes an impossibility. Last year, trains were carrying water to central India, where commodity agriculture, sugarcane in dry areas, BT cotton, very, very big drainer of water because it needs, it needs intensive irrigation, had already destroyed the water resources locally, and then the drought came. And this is the story of Syria. Why did a million peasants get uprooted in 2009? Climate change and non-sustainable farming. Why is Lake Chad today drying up? 80% water not allowed to enter the lake and add to that climate change. And then the rest of the conflict story is a derived story. So it, I really feel we also need to start seeing the refugee crisis as linked both to non-sustainability as well as climate change, which is aggravating the non-sustainability of the ground. And we need to rec start recognizing people who are having to find a home somewhere else on this planet, which is our home, as basically development refugees and climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the UN is uh, saying that already today, approximately half of those people who are internally displaced within their home country are actually uh, refugees because of the environmental destruction and because of climate change. Absolutely. And I absolutely. guess we see more of that. Yeah. But of course, I mean, we kind of all know those problems already. And I would say the awareness has been raising around that. But still, we have so many problems of not seeing enough progress when it comes to gender equality, but also when it comes to fighting climate change, when it comes to uh, develop and, and implement um, sustainable agriculture, for example. Who do you think is creating these obstacles? Who, does, who, who, so to say, is the enemy in that game? And, yeah. and who do we need to fight there? Well, I, I think we need to just look at the facts. Look at the fact that today, eight men control half the wealth of the world. It used to be 388 six years ago. Last year, it was 62. So the 1% versus 99% is long obsolete. It's getting smaller. So there are particular individuals gaining from the destruction of the planet and the livelihoods of people and destroying women's economies, destroying women's livelihoods, as well as their right to basic needs of food and water, education, health. Uh, but I would not use the word enemy. I would use the word structures. There are structures of destruction that have benefited a very few and they happen to be all men, who have imposed patriarchal categories on the world, that humans are superior to nature, that men are superior to women, whites are superior to blacks and browns. And that bundle of exclusions is what's creating all the multiple crises we face today, whether it is gender inequality or the planetary crisis of climate change and species erosion, or the economic inequality of the 1%, 99%, and I would add the climate of hate and fear, because the economy of greed goes hand in hand with defending that greed through dividing society on the basis of the lines of diversity and turning hate and fear into a protective immunity for greed making. So I would say it's the processes and structures we really need to understand better. And that's why the women's gaze becomes so important. Because women have had to suffer 
the burden of non-sustainable farming, poisoning, pesticides, disappearance of the species. It's women. I mean, I started my ecological life in 1970s, where women of my region came out and said, we're going to hug the trees. Your deforestation is leading to floods, is making us walk further for water. And uh, we are going to protect our lives by protecting the forests. And you'll have to kill us before you kill the trees. A decade of this kind of work, eventually, we got a logging ban in the Himalaya. The movement was called Chipko, which means to hug. And I think if there's one thing women can teach the rest of the world is we know how to hug. We know how to hug trees. We know how to hug the soil. We know how to hug each other. And this patriarchal instinct of violence and destruction against the earth and against diverse societies is not acceptable. We will create another future. Great. So what do you think can we learn from your struggle in India? I mean, we here in the European Union, we see a lot of women's struggles as well. We have a huge gender pay gap. We have environmental destruction without end. What do you think can we learn from your struggle? I, I have personally always learned a lot from my sisters who seem to be in a very difficult situation. And yet, they always show a new strength. I remember a particular time, I was, uh, I'd been asked by our ministry to do a study on mining, and we got the Supreme Court to sh shut the mines. Uh, there was one mine that was not in the map. The women came and asked me, why did you leave it out? I said, they didn't give it in the map. Will you join us for a non-cooperation, a chipko of the mountain? I said, sure. After a few days, the miners came with the typical way, hitting them, breaking their bones. And I got the message, so I rushed to the village. And here were the women, in bandages, in <laughs> casts for their fractures, sitting right at the blockade. And I said, where do you get this strength? And Itwari Devi, the 65-year-old woman who's no more, said something that has always been my lesson, which is a lesson to every woman and every man of the world. She said, this grass we are walking on, it jumps right back. I take the trees of uh, the leaves of these trees for my animals. The trees grow right back. That power of renewal that's in the grass and the tree and the stream is the power in us. That is what we call Shakti. And that Shakti is expressed without some patriarch giving us a little favor and saying, I'll give you a little power. No, we have the power got to exercise it, but our power is power in creative and non-violent form. It's a power of oneness with the earth and each other. We will not adopt your destructive power, nor will we allow you to exercise it to destroy this planet. Yeah, and I think also a lot of women globally are more and more um, seeing and experiencing this power. No, I mean, we have an in the European Union, we have a couple of cases, uh, like in Poland, where women are taking to the streets, being really strong, very active. We see it also in Turkey, but also in the US or in Argentina, where we have uh, big demonstrations by women, uh, for example, against um, the, the killing of women just because they're a woman, uh, against abortion bans and stuff. Do you think this could be the beginning of a new global women's rights movement? I think it's a continuity of movements that have had to arise every time there's this insanity. And women are the ones who come out in front with their deeper commitment to the larger society, with their deeper commitment to protect the planet. And for this moment, where on the one hand, the destruction of capitalist patriarchy is really reaching the limits in every way. And that is shown both in the way the economy is going, but as well as in the way politics is going. Precisely at that time, women are rising. And I do feel that together we will create another world. And that rising is not organized by someone else. No one says to the women of Argentina or Poland, rise on this. They know when to rise. Yeah, I think this is a really encouraging message that we see you know, all these women going out uh, on the streets because also there's still so much to do when it comes to women's rights. But of course, you've mentioned all these uh, struggles that are, of course, all interconnect interconnected, environmental, the economic and all of those things. Where do you think can we work together or where should we work together across continents in order to achieve something? I think there are two very, very important ways in which we are working together, but we need to increase 
that collaboration, that solidarity. The first is we are bringing the awareness that we are citizens of one common earth, one planet. We are earth citizens. And as earth citizens, women are the teachers of how to live as an earth citizen. Because they were not busy destroying the earth. They were busy going to fetch the water from a spring. They were busy going to the forest to meet their needs. They were busy creating that lovely garden that was organic while the men sprayed poisons on the commodity crop. In Nigeria, on 5% land, women grow 50% of the food. Across the world, it's these tiny little gardens that women cultivate in order to feed their families. That is the source of real food. 75% of the food that we eat is coming from these small farms and small gardens, not from the industrial farms, which are destroying the planet, 75% destruction of water, of soil, of biodiversity, and as my book, Soil Not Oil, says, 50% destruction of the climate through the greenhouse gases. So capitalist patriarchy made it look like humans are separate from nature. But women and peasants and indigenous cultures always knew we are part of nature. So we don't have to artificially put two movements together, the rights of women and the rights of nature they are one movement for freedom of all life on earth. So at this point, it's about living a leadership role in a different kind of leadership, a participatory leadership, a leadership through practice, which is in defense of one planet, our common home, and one humanity. I think the entire threat to society today is by dividing society and taking away our humanity. We are either Muslim or Hindu either Muslim or Christian, we are either white or black or brown, and everyone is being told, kill, 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 kill. No, we are one humanity, and we don't have to kill to feel at home with our identities. Our identities come deeper, they come from the earth. So let us not be divided then. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Ivanana <laughs> Shiva. Thank you so much for being with us today for International Women's Day, and let's keep up the struggle. Absolutely. Happy Women's Day to all.